Welcome to this episode of Season 4 of The Common Bridge, where policy and current events are discussed in a fiercely nonpartisan manner. The host, Richard Helpe, is a philanthropist, entrepreneur, and political analyst who has reached over 3.5 million listeners, viewers, and readers around the world. The Common Bridge is available on the Substack website and the Substack app. Just search for The Common Bridge. You can find the program on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. The Common Bridge draws guests and audiences from across the political spectrum, and we invite you to become a free or paid subscriber on your favorite medium. Hello and welcome to The Common Bridge. And we've got a great story for you today. It's actually going to turn the tables a little bit and interview our producer, Brian Kruger, because among other accomplishments in his life. He's been a documentary filmmaker. Brian, welcome to The Common Bridge. And it's great to be here, Rich, and the tables have turned. <laughs> Indeed they have. We've got the camera actually turned on for you today. Um, but it looks an important topic today because February is Black History Month um, because much of the history was written without including the history of Black people. And the uh, the tradition for a black history studies goes back uh, to the 1920s, and it was formed uh, in February to honor the birth of President Abraham Lincoln, uh, of course, with his role in trying to promote equality uh, among the races. In, in the late 1960s, uh, what was then called Negro History Week had evolved into what is known as Black History Month. Uh, colleges, universities began to hold commemorations with Kent State University being one of the first. So it was in 1976 with President Gerald Ford, uh, the only person ever to serve as president, having never been elected as president, nor having been elected as vice president. Thank you, 25th Amendment. <laughs> he recognized officially Black History Month during the country's 1976 bicentennial. Uh, Ford called upon Americans to, quote, seize the opportunity to honor the often neglected accomplishments of Black Americans in every endeavor throughout our history. Uh, and of course, this was codified um, just a few years later by President Ronald Reagan. Um, so Gerald Ford served as president from August 9th, 1974 uh, to January 20th, 1977. Uh, probably when you read about Gerald Ford, you hear about the pardon of Richard Nixon, uh, which you know, arguably cost Gerald Ford the reelection or the deal, actual election. Um, but Ford was one of those guys that seemed to honor country first versus political party versus his own personal ambition, something that we could use a little bit more of these days. Uh, but what was Gerald Ford's motivation for such ardent support of Black History Month? It goes back to 1934, and we've got Brian here to tell you about us. Brian, you made a documentary about this. What's it called? It's called Black and Blue, the story of Gerald Ford, Willis Ward, and the 1934 Michigan-Georgia Tech football game. It's a long title, but we had to get it all in there because it really explains what it was and what, what the story is about. So Willis Ward, tell us about him. So um, let me recap how that goes. So Willis Ward was a world-class in high school at Detroit Northwestern High School, was a world-class track athlete. He had set indoor track records um, for the um, – not only not not only the uh, distance running and short uh, short running, but also uh, hurdles, high hurdles, low hurdles. He was an incredible athlete, and he was uh, being groomed and being scouted by uh, Dartmouth College to play football because Dartmouth College was one of the very rare instances where colleges would allow a black player to play. It, it wasn't very common back then, but so he was going to go to Dartmouth. He was also being really scouted by the University of Michigan, who had a uh, an athletic director who was not very favorable of having black football players. He had black athletes, but they were on the track team, and they were kind of you know moved over to that. Who was that? Field. That was uh, Fielding H. Yost, legendary coach and athletic director, Fielding H. Yost. And 
Yost made it very clear that there were not going to be any black players on his football team. And in fact, Michigan hadn't had a black player on their team since the late 1800s before Yost showed up. So there was a precedent here that was going back some 40 years. But Willis Ward made quite a splash in the Detroit area and then nationwide. And the coach of Michigan football at the time was a guy named Harry Kipke, who was a star for the University of Michigan as an athlete as well. And he'd been the coach of the football team for a couple of years, and Michigan was good. They were undefeated national champions in 1932 and 1933. And they, Ward was there at that time, but prior to that, Michigan had just built their brand new stadium. There's a lot of excitement on campus, and they were building that, those championship teams. So Harry Kipke knew of Willis Ward, and he lobbied not uh, fielding Yost. He lobbied some of the board members at the University of Michigan and said, hey, can I recruit this guy? Let's get this guy in. You guys deal with Yost. I'm going to bring in Willis Ward. And that's where the quote-unquote uh, fun started. And, and over in Grand Rapids on the other side of the state, uh, was a very good athlete by the name of Jerry Ford, uh, who enrolled at the University of Michigan, uh, ultimately became an All-American uh, player for the Wolverines. And these two were roomed together. Is that correct? That is correct. And they met on the very first day at the University of Michigan, both as freshmen, and they both knew who each other was. They were both all state football players, uh, Gerald Ford coming out of Grand Rapids South and Willis Ward coming out of Detroit Northwestern. So they knew of each other. And on the first day at college registration and they're getting things sorted out, they met each other and they became friends instantly. And from their freshman year, and freshmen weren't allowed to play football back then, so they could only play their sophomore, junior, and senior years, Ford and Ward became friends on the freshman or JV team. As the years progressed, um, Willis Ward became a starter as a sophomore, as a junior, and as a senior. He was very good and very fast. Gerald Ford was playing behind uh, an All-American, and I'm going to think of his name right now. I apologize for not thinking of it. But, um, so he was a center, and he was just going to play behind him until his senior year. Gerald Ford did not start for the University of Michigan until 1934, his senior year. And it meant the world for Gerald Ford to be a starter on the University of Michigan. But as we know from the documentary, all hell broke loose in 1934. So you have these two young men uh, bonded over their athletic prowess. They come to this huge campus, one from uh, the biggest city in Michigan, Detroit, one from uh, probably the second biggest city at that time, Grand Rapids. Uh, they meet, they become friends, they practice football. Uh, the fellow from Detroit was a better athlete, more prepared to compete, um, and his friend was behind a very, very good player. But now we've got two back-to-back -back national championships in 1932, 1933. The 1934 season is about to begin. And I understand that a team from the South, Georgia Tech, had agreed to, to travel to Ann Arbor to play the University of Michigan in the stadium that has now become known as the Big House and one of the announcers from Michigan used to refer to this as the hole that Yost dug. So Fielding H. Yost was a impactful and a very big name in college football and particularly at the University of Michigan. And the ice arena at the University of Michigan where the Wolverine hockey team plays is called Yost Arena. That's correct. That So... He, he, he looms large. Yeah, he loomed large nationwide. He was he was right up there with Alonzo Stagg and um, some of those guys from the early 20s. They, they, and Newt Rockney was another one. Um, they really uh, painted the picture, set the rules. They really set forth what college football even is to this day. Um, Fielding Yost was a huge, huge influencer in college football. So everybody kind of looked to Yost for, hey, what do we do next? <laughs> Um, so this becomes very interesting. In 1934, we're in the middle of the Depression, and Willis, or, I'm sorry, and uh, Fielding Yost is looking to put people in the seats of that big stadium, the big hole, the big house, they call it. And he looked to the South because in Detroit, we had a lot of workers coming up from the South, and they were in Michigan. And he figured, hey, I wonder if I bring in a team from the South that we can fill that stadium up even more 
uh, during these years. And it wasn't a bad idea. And the problem, of course, was that teams from the South, south of the Mason-Dixon line, they had uh, rules throughout the South that teams from the South would not take the field if there was a black player playing on the opposing team. And Fielding H. Yost knew this. And early in 1934, Fielding H. Yost was down to Georgia Tech. He had a connection uh, with uh, his brother-in-law who knew the athletic director, um, uh, Alexander, in, uh, at Georgia Tech. And they became friends. And he went down there. Yost went down to talk to the football team and say, hey, you guys, you got a good program going here. And if you'd like, we'd like to have you come up to play in Michigan. And they love that. Well, Alexander asked him at the time, say, I understand you have a black player up there. We're not going to play with a, with a black player. You understand that? And Yost said, oh, yeah, no, I'll take care of that. But Yost wasn't talking to anybody about this in the spring of 1934. And then come about May or June of 1934, telegrams started coming back up from Georgia Tech going, we can't wait to play in your new stadium. This is going to be amazing. It's going to be good for our program. We're going to play the national champions. Can't wait. Just a reminder, we don't play against black players. So do I have your word that you're not going to play your only black player, Willis Ward? So Brian, if I'm not mistaken, these Southern teams that would request, in fact, they'd require uh, their opponents not to have any black players, but they would offer to bench players of, on their own team of similar capability or similar stature, correct? That is correct. And it wasn't so much an offer. That was part of the bargaining. So that both teams would sit down and go, okay, so if we're sitting down our guy, our African-American player, let's see what kind of impact we can have on that on, on your team. And sometimes it got contentious, but generally they'd come up to an agreement. And sometimes it wasn't just one player, it was two or three just to make it even. And uh, Georgia Tech, you know, had offered and Michigan accepted uh, the person, a guy named uh, uh, Hoot Gibson uh, was the person who was going to be benched for Georgia Tech should they end up playing this game. Uh, Hoot Gibson was quoted later in life in, in, the, in the 1960s and early 70s that he still hadn't forgiven the uh, Georgia Tech University for benching him for a black guy. Still had that racism in him all the way to the end of, of his days. But Well, uh, you think about the roots of the racism, too. Uh, I think it's important for people to understand what was fielding Yost's family like, and particularly the close connection with the Confederacy. That's right. Uh, uh, Fielding Yost, of course, comes out of the South, West Virginia, and his father was a surgeon for General Lee uh, for the Confederate Army in the Civil War. So it's not like, it, not, not that this is acceptable at all, but as you said, it does kind of lay the groundwork for where uh, Fielding Yost is coming from. To him, it's much more of a, oh, sure, yeah, we'll, we'll bench our black guy, no problem, because that's just the way he was. And it was an unspoken thing at the University of Michigan. Everybody just looked the other way. And plus, during the time of Jim Crow, it wasn't shocking that that was going on. Look, there were a lot of schools, not a lot. There, there were some schools in the North, in, in the Big Ten. Ohio State was one. Um, I think Illinois, Minnesota might have been. They had a black player as well. But other than that, there weren't very many around for the exact same reason. So it gets to be one of those things if you're judging the man today for what the – feelings were back then, it's probably probably not quite a fair judgment. But, but, and, and similarly, it also gives rise to the connection between the philosophy of the Confederacy uh, and protests today or flying the Confederate flag and, and such, that there is a direct link there and it should enrage people. So now we're back to 1934. And as far as fielding Yost is, is concerned, Georgia Tech's going to come up, bench their player, Hoot Gibson. Michigan's going to keep Willis Ward out of the game, and everything's fine. But then a young man named Gerald Ford got wind of this. What happened? Well, we'll take it back to June of the, in, the, in the summer. So what's happening is word starts to get out that this game's going to be played, and then reporters, national reporters, uh, from the sports magazines in New York, from Time Magazine, they start calling the University of Michigan going, hey, looks like Georgia Tech's coming up to play, you guys. We see a problem. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Yost's response to that was to have no response. He refused to answer, and he said, hey, you know, I, I, I don't know if that's true or not. We'll have to see what happens. Well, Yeltsin knew exactly what was going to happen with that. Georgia Tech knew from a telegram that we have in the documentary 
that he's all set. They're coming up. The, they're going. They're going to play Michigan. Michigan's going to bench their African American player. Well, when that summer in the summer it started leaking out, the football team started going. Wait a minute. So what's going to happen? And the buzz within the locker room was. Yost is going to bench Willis Ward. Now, Willis Ward was not only uh, a friend, he, he was, he was well-liked within the team, but his roommate on the road, you know, 20-year-old kid by the name of Gerald Ford, said this. And keep in mind, Gerald Ford hadn't started for the University of Michigan his any of his eligible years. This was the year he was going to start. And he was a and, captain, too, right? And captain. Ford yep. was captain, yeah. Yep. And he said, look, if uh, – if, if they bench you, I'm not going to play. And it's what he told Ward. And he even wrote a, a note back to his dad and said, I, I, you know, should I quit the team? And he even went to Kipke and said, if, he, if, if you bench him, I quit. Well, now, now we have something going on. Now the student body is starting to get involved. And there starts to be protests on campus when the students come back in August. So we're getting you know, closer to the game. Uh, and, and it gets so bad that they start taking sides, right? And Back then, it was you found mostly that the uh, the fraternities were very much a, you know, hey, Georgia Tech is our guest. We need to bring him up here. We'll bench Ward. We just got to let this go. We're they're our guests. We need to, you know, uh, we need to agree with what they're asking. And of course, the rest of the university was going crazy on it. But this became national news. It was in the New York Times and it was in uh, Time Magazine. It became a huge deal that Yost thought would just go away. And so Michigan starts that after becoming un after being undefeated two years in a row. They start out that season um, losing their first three games, and now it's really starting to get crazy. The team is really affected by it. Everybody's affected by it. But officially, before Georgia Tech comes up, the week before they come up, there's still no decision on whether or not they're going to play this game because the University of Michigan students say, "Look, cancel the game. Just cancel it all the way up until then." Of course, Yost has no intentions of doing this he's just not saying anything and then when they get down to the game uh, the night before the game they have a big meeting with georgia tech with the university of michigan university of michigan board members and such and they said look we're going to bench ward and we're going to play this game and not only did they say that they made sure that ward wasn't at the game at all ward wanted to be on the sidelines rooting his team on but they said, no, you can't be in the stadium at all. So you're going to have to listen to the game on the radio. Actually, the, first they said, go down to Ohio State and why don't, why don't you uh, drive down there, drive down to Columbus and scout that team. He says, well, I don't want to do that. So he just listened to it on the radio. But he, he was banned from his own stadium that day as well. And uh, Yost, knowing that there was going to be problems and protests, he hired the Pinkerton guards to come up. Um, there was a rule made that they're going to control the rioting, but they're not going to use um, tear gas if the riders get on the field. It was it was that wound up. Well, the it's the, like the, the parallels today in, in terms of uh, seeking justice and uh, the preemptive strikes. I mean, it, it almost like we're not getting any better. Um, but let's talk just a minute about the game and then Willis Ward and Gerald Ford post. And of course, this is all in the documentary called Black and Blue. And Brian, how can somebody view Black and Blue? How do they get a hold of this documentary? Um, it's I think you can find it on Amazon, uh, the, 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 uh, the DVD out there. Um, I think that's probably it. I think it's streamable. You can stream it on it off of Amazon as well. Or you can go to stunt3.com and we can send you one as well. Um, or you can write to the show, and we'll we'll make sure you get a streaming link. How's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or write, you know, write us at uh, at editor at the Common Bridge um, at Substack dot com, and and we'll send you one as well. Um, but so, yeah, so the, the game, game started. I'm sorry, the game played, and apparently Gerald Ford played the game of his life. He did. <laughs> they, they decided to play the game. The game started out really, really rough. The guys on the Georgia Tech team were not at all uh, happy. Uh, about all of the controversy and they let Michigan even know about it. And they were chirping at the Michigan players, calling them the N word lovers and such and back and forth. And it got ugly. And Gerald Ford, there was one guy in particular who was really doing that on the line of scrimmage and Gerald Ford pounded this guy so hard that he broke three ribs on the initial first set of downs. And I think he broke his leg and he was carted off. And the next day, you know, George or uh, uh, Gerald Ford and some of his teammates went over to Willis Ward and said, "We made that tackle for you." 
<laughs> you know, we, we, we went after those guys. But Michigan ended up winning that game. And it was the only game that Michigan won the whole season. They were one and seven. And it was the worst uh, the, the, the worst season in Michigan football history to this day. And they went from two undefeated seasons to a one and seven record. That was the only game they won. And the rest of the year after that game, Michigan only scored 12 offensive points and all 12 were scored by Willis Ward. So we now have these two young men finishing their college career. They're in a nationally recognized story uh, with real reporters doing real reporting. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah, Ponder right. that one for a moment, if you will. I, there's a, there's I, a documentary, Rich. <laughs> yeah, imagine how the story would be covered today. You know what? <laughs> Nothing to see here versus <laughs> this is the end of the world, okay, <laughs> depending on where you, you tuned in. Um, so I think people understand Gerald Ford's path. He uh, began uh, working hard, literally door-to-door, -door, uh, running for the United States Congress. He was a able representative, continually reelected. Um, when uh, Spiro Agnew uh, resigned and then uh, Richard Nixon resigned, uh, the 25th Amendment carried Gerald Ford into the Oval Office. And Gerald Ford, with his lifelong friend and his love for justice, said, we're going to help change the country. That's right. But what happened to Willis Ward after college? Okay, so Willis Ward's story becomes very interesting. Uh, the football season ends in 1934. In the spring of 1935, Ward, remember, is a world-class track athlete. And he's on the track team. And he's the only guy in the country to beat, at that time, uh, Jesse Owens. And, it, it, and, so that, it, and Jesse Owens and Willis Ward become friends as well. But in the spring in Ann Arbor... Jesse Owens sets, I believe, four world records at uh, uh, Fisher. I'm, I'm getting the name wrong now. Uh, is it Fisher Field? Yeah, Fisher Field, where Michigan used to play football next to Yale's. Um, but it, but it was a great day. Uh, Willis Ward couldn't compete that day because he had a torn muscle. But they became great friends. Willis Ward talked about that. You know that that it was an amazing day to watch. But also held in his back pocket that he had beaten uh, Jesse Owens. But a month after that, Willis Ward went to the Olympic trials because he wanted to qualify for uh, the 1936 Olympics, which of course were the infamous Olympics in Berlin hosted by Adolf Hitler. Willis Ward qualified for the team as a decathlete. And that's, you know, all the, all the events. And he was, uh, he was the top ranked uh, Olympian for 1936 going to Berlin. And he decided not to. And his quote was, I didn't want to be Jim Crowed like I was in Ann Arbor in Berlin by um, Adolf Hitler. And we all remember what Jesse Owens ended up doing at that, at that. It's, Olympic, it's so. a, a sad commentary on so many fronts, it, um, it is. but it shows you what a principled man Willis Ward was. That's right. And, and then, so, yes. Yeah, so, so in the summer of 1935, after Willis Ward decides, you know, he's not going to go to the Olympics and such, he goes to work for Henry Ford. And Henry Ford hires him along with uh, Harry Bennett. And if you know something about the history of, Henry, of, of Ford Motor Company, you'll know who Harry Bennett was. He was a little bit of Ford's, well, officially his security guy. Clark, um, I think is the word you're looking for. Can we <laughs> yeah. use that word anymore because that's what he was. He was a, just a brutal guy, yeah? He was a thug. But he also had a very close relationship with Harry Kipke uh, and gave uh, Kipke's football players during the summer – he would hire them, uh, uh, Harry Bennett would hire him to work for Ford Motor Company, but back then it mostly meant that Kipke could uh, practice the University of Michigan football team behind the old administration building on Miller Road. Um, that, of course, was an NC2A violation, and it was back then. It got Kipke in a bunch of trouble, trouble towards the end. Anyway, but Ford goes to work for, or I'm sorry, Willis Ward goes to work for Henry Ford, and Henry Ford puts him at the Rouge plant because one of the big problems they're having at the, the, the Rouge factory was one of Henry Ford's doings, but it's I think it's an incredible thing to do back then, is he would hire African-American workers to come up and work side by side on the line at the Rouge for the exact same pay as the white workers. And that was kind of unheard of at the time. And so Henry Ford brings Willis Ward to the Rouge plant to work with um, 
in, in kind of a super vo- supervisory fashion with workers on the line at the Rouge plant. We have pictures in the documentary, Willis Ward wore a suit and tie. He was arguably the highest paid executive or the most influential African-American executive in the country at that time, because Ford Motor Company at the time was one of the largest uh, corporations. So he does that for a while, but Willis Ward wants to be a lawyer. So he approaches and tells uh, Harry Bennett that, look, I want to go to law school. Well, Henry Ford hears about this and says, look, stay with us. I'll pay you twice as much as any lawyer would ever make. Just stay with us. We really like having you here. And in fact, Willis Ward uh, would go on trips in the South with Henry Ford to give speeches about working with Ford Motor Company, which I thought was very interesting as well. But Willis Ward decides, no, I'm going to go to law school instead. And right about that time, he did in, in enroll in, in, into uh, into law school in in Detroit. But right about that time, World War II starts, and both Willis Ward and Gerald Ford end up going into World War II. Of course, Ford goes into the Navy, and Willis Ward goes into the Army. And they come out of that. As you said, Gerald Ford then runs for office, and Willis Ward does too. Willis Ward in 1950 runs against Charles Diggs, and Willis Ward runs as a Republican in a very, very strong Democrat uh, um, precinct in, in Detroit and loses to Charles Diggs. But Willis Ward stays with law. He works um, with the uh, Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. Gerald Ford stays friends with him. They stay in touch the whole time. And as, as you had pointed out, you get into the 60s, and when Gerald Ford becomes one of the only Republicans at first to support um, – the voters' rights amendment. Um, he he really he, he was he was the minority whip at the time, but he got a lot of his guys in line and said, "Look, we're going to support this." And you really are hard pressed not to think that his relationship with Willis Ward and watching what happened to Willis Ward in 1934 didn't have an impact on that. So it's um, you know, they, their lives stayed commingled together all the way through uh, when Willis Ward passed away in 1981 and all the way up until when Gerald Ford passed away. And then he even starts to connect after that. And Well, we Willis that Ward, though, well. before before we jump on to that, did, didn't he become a probate judge? He did. He became the first African-American probate judge for Wayne County. And in fact, he was in charge of, not in charge, because this went on for a long time, but he was, he, he, he was in charge of the, of the Dodge family trust. And that wasn't settled until Willis Ward finally got it all nailed down, and that was forty years <laughs> in the making. But yeah, he was a he was a probate judge. During so that. Willis, Willis Ward goes on to a very distinguished career in industry with Ford Motor Company. By the way, Gerald Ford has no connection at all to the Ford Motor Company. It's just that's right. Happenstance. That's There's right. And nothing. No and family fact, relationship right. or anything. In fact, at Gerald all. Ford's real last name is not Ford at all. He was a stepson. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was adopted by his uh, by his uh, stepfather. Yes, that's right. Um, and so Willis Ward has a distinguished career. He becomes a judge. They be- remain friends throughout Willis's life. And Gerald Ford, when he has the opportunity, does this for uh, Black History Month. Um, I think it's a great testimony um, to the awful things that Willis Ward, uh, you know arguably immensely talented man. No, not arguably. I think this is a testimony to the certifiably extraordinary man that Willis Ward was. Absolutely. Um, and that bond between two people who in today's terms couldn't be more different based on the amount of melanin in their skin. That's exactly right. Um, and I think it's an ideal that we should all continue to strive for. Um, Gerald Ford was not popular for his role. Um, it was willing to put everything on the line. Um, Willis Ward uh, was victimized um, and fought through that. And we have this great story in the documentary called Black and Blue. Um, it's about what, a 45 minute story, Brian? It runs about an hour. We had to cut it for PBS, so it's actually exactly fifty-six minutes, fifty-four seconds. <laughs> so, <laughs> but well, but it, it's an amazing that story. That fifty-six their lives... second is going to be missed, but um, you can get the whole <laughs> thing either streaming, and we'll again we'll put up instructions on how to get uh, to the product. Um, did 
Gerald Ford ever mention Willis Ward after leaving the presidency? No, you know, he did on um, uh, on the Larry King show. And, and we have a funny aside from that. Um, when we were making the documentary, we asked the same question, Rich. We said, is there anything out there where Gerald Ford talks about the Willis Ward uh, instance? And on live TV, uh, we didn't know of any until Steve Ford, Gerald Ford's son, called and said, hey, I do remember one. It was he was we were on the Larry King show together. I was with him and he brought it up and you can get a clip of that. So I went to CNN and got the clip and it was going to cost us and we're documentary filmmakers. So, you know, go with us on this. It was going to cost us about twenty eight thousand dollars to license that piece of film to which Steve Ford told me. He said, hey, Brian, don't worry about that. My dad and Larry King were great friends. So let me let me handle that. And a couple of days later, Steve Ford called me again and said, well, it turns out that my dad and Larry King weren't that great of friends. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but the Gerald Ford Foundation. He was a, a $27,000 friend. <laughs> no, right. the 28, no, 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 you're not, yeah. you're not that the, close. The Gerald Ford Foundation, uh, which I think Steve Ford was the president at the time, um, covered that cost for us for the film, which, which was great. But the other time that Gerald Ford spoke about that, spoke and he wrote about that, was in the New York Times during the University of Michigan's Battle of Affirmative Action uh, back, I can't remember the year it was now, but he wrote an op-ed piece for the New York Times and said, I think that the affirmative action law might be a good thing, and here's why. And he told the story of Willis Ward then. And those are the only two we can think of that that, that really ever happened. Um, and then President Bush mentioned it, and this is how we le- heard of the story. President Bush mentioned the Willis Ward story at Gerald Ford's funeral when he was eulogizing the former president. That's when the story really came out again, and we looked into it and made the documentary. Well, it's a great story, and as we all mark Black History Month, there's a lot to learn. Uh, it's a sad chapter in our history, and it's also inspiring. Um We are on our way, God willing, toward a more perfect union. Uh, And Brian, I applaud you and your other documentary makers to bring this story to the fore. Um, And Brian, uh, as you've been uh, side by side with me on all of the Common Bridge episodes, is there anything that we didn't cover today that perhaps we should have? You know, there's one short thing that that I want to put, sort of put a bow on this. After Gerald Ford had passed away, uh, a group of uh, Republicans in Lansing, uh, the capital of Michigan, got together and said, you know, we should get, we should put a, a statue of Gerald Ford in the Capitol Rotunda. And everybody thought, not everybody, a lot of people thought, hey, that's not a bad idea. Let's look into this. Well, it turns out that he had some trouble with that in Lansing. This is just a state now, because here's what has to happen if you do that. Every state in the union, I didn't know this until we made the film, every state in the union gets two statues in the, uh, at, at the, in the rotunda, or in the Capitol, um, Statuary Hall. And uh, Michigan, if, if we're going to get a Gerald Ford statue in, I, I think our two statues are uh, Zacharias Chandler, who was an abolitionist war hero in the Civil War, and I think Lewis Cass is the other one. So they're going to have to move Zachariah Chandler. So they brought that up with the whole legislative body in Lansing. And the Democrats in Detroit mostly said, hey, there's nothing that we know of that Gerald Ford ever did for civil rights. So, And we're a fan of Zachariah Chandler because he was an abolitionist hero. So we're not going to we're not going to do this. We don't support that, making the statue or even getting it replaced. And that was that. Well, just at that time, after that first vote, a gentleman stood up and said, let me tell you a story about Gerald Ford. And this guy told a story about Gerald Ford and Willis Ward, told the whole story, just like we had heard it just now. And it was um, Buzz Thomas. And Buzz Thomas was Willis Ward's grandson. And he's African-American who was a representative in Detroit. And as Buzz Thomas said, after I sat down, there was a long, quiet pause. And then somebody said, let's vote on this again. And it was a unanimous vote to change that statue. And to this day, there's a statue of Gerald Ford, not in Statuary Hall, but in the rotunda. There's Gerald Ford. And it's mostly because of who he was, how he got there, unelected, and what he ended up doing. And, you know, pardoning Nixon, which at the time cost him the election. But all scholars now say that was the thing to do. And he also, I think he helped out the draft Dodgers as well on the same day. But anyway... The fact of the matter is that the Will, that Willis Ward's family and Gerald Ford's family, they're helping each other out all to the very end. And then two years ago, 
Buzz Thomas was put on the board of directors of the Gerald Ford Foundation. So those two families are still together that started from that friendship back in the 30s. Well, it's a wonderful story. I, again, recommend the movie Black and Blue, uh, the story of the 1934 Michigan-Georgia Tech football game. Uh, Willis Ward, Gerald Ford. Uh, hope everybody takes some time to get a little more education during this Black History Month. And so with our special guest and our producer, Mr. Brian Kruger, this is Rich Helpy signing off on The Common Bridge. Thanks for joining us on The Common Bridge. Subscribe to The Common Bridge on Substack.com or use their Substack app where you can find more interviews, columns, videos, and nonpartisan discussions of the day. Just search for The Common Bridge. You can also find The Common Bridge on Mission Control Radio on your Radio Garden app.